What I'm gonna be talking about today is over the last 20 years, over the last 10 years of leading agile, the last 20 years in sort of this industry space, um, it's become pretty evident that some companies are able to respond to the market really fast and some companies struggle. And you can be doing some of the same practices. You might be doing safe somewhere and it works and you're doing safe somewhere else it doesn't. You might be doing some design thinking with your product group and it's working some places and it's not others. You might be doing less. I'm trying to think of some other branded type things, but there might be a lot of things you're doing. And so what is it that the companies have in common that make this work? Because when you go back and you look at your organizations and analyze it, you kind of want to figure out um, what do we actually have to do to get there? One of the things I say all the time is, do the conditions exist for that process to work? Like, do you understand what conditions need to exist in your organization for this to be successful? Um, and I think most of the time we're trying to look for a script, we're trying to look for a process or a set of practices or a technique that will answer our question. And a lot of times we're trying to do it in the least painful way possible. So I'm gonna talk through um, four major things that have to be in place for an organization to, success, to successfully achieve agility. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that all of them are hard. Right? None of them are easy. There are no easy answers to the places that you want to go to. Um, I'm going to talk about aligning the structure. And what I mean by structure is, like your org structure or your hierarchy, um, your team structure. How, how have you aligned your people in your organization? What roles have you given them and how have you set them up to do the work in the organization? Um, you have to get the structure right for Agile to work. Uh, we're going to talk about governance. And governance is an interesting, an interesting word. It's, it gets really overloaded. And I'm going to talk about what bad governance looks like a little bit. And I'm sure, how many of y'all might be familiar with what bad governance looks like? Right? Lots of overhead, slowing things down, very painful, right? Um, but governance is absolutely necessary in organizations of any scale in order to be responsible. And so what does good governance look like? And what are the companies that are doing good governance, what do they have in place that's allowing that to be successful? Um, we're going to talk about what you measure. You know, it's really interesting. I was actually in a meeting last week with a, with a scrum coach at a client, big multinational um, financial, financial company, financial services, captive finance company. And one of the comments that came out of this guy is, we don't think there's anything of value you can measure in a delivery team because it will be just, just be used against us. So we don't believe in tooling things up and having any metrics. And it's like, this is a big company with real people and that's, that's totally irresponsible, but why does that belief exist and what do we need to do about it to make the right measures and metrics be in place in the organization? And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, leading the system. So it's really interesting. One of the things that we struggle with sometimes as a company, Mike said he has two minds around this mindset. It's a love-hate relationship. You've got to change the mindset, but you can't change the mindset until you fix the, uh, um, the organization for that mindset to be the appropriate mindset, right? Well, we tell leaders all the time that they have to be servant leaders. You've got to back off. You've got to create space. I think that's foolish advice in most big organizations. And I'm going to talk about that some. Because um, for me to ask you to trust your responsibilities into an organization that isn't trustworthy yet is a bad decision. And we walk in from the bottom up telling leadership to change it. We need to start telling leadership what it means to build an organization that can deliver agility. Does that make sense to y'all? Cool. Um, so the structure of the organization is aligned. What do I mean by that? There's one really foundational uh, concept, one really important concept that you have to be able to form teams to do knowledge work today. The work we're doing today isn't linear. You can't like get the requirements right and then go build it, then validate it independently and then deploy it independently. Everything's interrelated. And especially as we're trying to move faster, the latency in decision making slows things down. You've got to be able to form cross-functional teams with everything needed to deliver an increment of whatever they're responsible for. So what does that mean? What does everything necessary mean? It means they have the right skills on the team. They have the right information to make the types of decisions they have to make. They have the agency to control the things that keep them from being successful. One of the things that I see with the Scrum Master model, and this is probably, again, a little bit um, anti-agile, but I don't mean it to be. It's just if we expect a Scrum Master in a uh, um, travel port to go change the way that compliance is going to control the PII data so their team can move faster, do you guys get the foolishness of that? The Scrum Master doesn't have the agency to remove the impediments to making progress work. So we can't expect 
that to happen. So what happens is there's actually layers of decisions in the organization. There's layers of context. Brian showed a picture a little bit earlier that talked about um, delivery. And then there's product management or program management. There's portfolio stuff. There's strategic stuff. There's probably teams all the way up. There's like a turtles all the way down joke. I don't remember it, but it's, it's probably sort of relevant. Um, that was supposed to be funny. I'm trying to keep you on your toes. The, uh, but when we talk about forming teams, we're not just forming delivery teams. Because delivery teams can't possibly have everything needed to deliver an increment of value in your organization today. Who can actually get a single delivery team to deliver your most critical business products, can deliver it to the market and support it? Right? So, so we have to build networks of teams with the right decisions very clearly made, with the right skills in each place, with the right information and agency. Being unclear about the structure, what teams uh, are formed, what they're formed around, and what responsibilities they have. Um, if, you, if, you, if you haven't formed the right teams, you're gonna, it's all going to fail. What types of things do we see in organizations that don't have good teams formed? Um, uh, IT becomes order takers, building everything that might be intended because they're not connected to a big decision. So, so they can't build anything smaller. They can't do these trade-offs. There's no feedback because everything's linear. Portfolios fund the world in a fire and forget model. They make strategic decisions, they come up with a list of projects, and they shove it into the organization and just expect it to get done, right? Our strategic planning processes are totally removed from our capacity and what our customers actually want and what's emerging in the market because the strategic planning stuff is taking place 18 months to 24 months before it's ever going to be executed on. Does any of that resonate with you all? all right. So if we can't form teams with the things necessary and the right decisions in place with to, to, to the right agency, the right information, the right decision rights, um, you can't solve this agile problem. That stuff is hard to do in every organization. Spinning up some scrum teams is a, a, a penny in the ocean. It's not going to change anything, right? So now it becomes, okay, cool, I'm ready to form teams. I think that's a good idea. Let's go form some teams. I'm ready to form them all the way up. What does forming them all the way up mean? And it's about connecting them to outcomes. I've been a strong proponent for, for over a decade about forming organizations around capabilities and aligning those capabilities with products or customer interactions. So what does it mean? Why is a capability like a way to form teams around? Why can define um, what it means for that capability to be performing well in the organization? And I can identify the performance gap. What does it mean? Because we, we have to define our organization as a set of capabilities and get really, really clear on what the outcomes are, what it means for that capability to be well performing. What is the performance gap of that capability? Here's a fascinating problem in most organizations that we look at. Um, is that project worth doing, yes or no? Yes, it will increase the ROI, or it will deliver this new functionality, or it will solve this problem. Is that a problem I need to solve? Is that the next most critical problem I need to solve to achieve my strategy? These, these decisions around portfolio decisions are devoid of the context of whether that decision, that problem being solved, is the next most valuable one for the company because we lack the context to have those conversations. Another critically vicious thing that we see in organizations where we fund things by projects is nobody owns the long-term health of the capability. Nobody's making sure it's safe and we can't afford to do the refactoring this project because it would crash my ROI. We can't afford to build that right because it'll make my project not make it to the top of the list because the cost is too low. So you end the cost is too high. So you end up making technical trade-offs in the bad on every single project. And within two to three years, most products are so rife with technical debt, they're so clogged up in their ability to deliver safely that they can't move at all. Does that resonate with anybody? So these aren't bad technical practices. These aren't incompetent people. These are design of the structure problems that come out because of the way that we do things. So you've got to form teams all the way up. You've got to make it be extremely clear. You've got to form these teams within capabilities and become very intentional about what it means for that capability to be successful. And if that capability is performing adequately to deliver on your strategy, should we keep investing in it just because there's something broken in it? Is that a good investment? It's working good enough? I mean, it's not perfect. It could be better. Is that a good set of dollars to spend to get better at that capability? Or is there probably something more broken, more relevant to delivering my strategy I should shift money to? Right? One of the things we do is we form investment patterns and we just peanut butter spread it out year over year over year to the same capabilities. There's got to be a way to be having the conversation around what does it mean to be successful as an organization? What are the next most important gaps for me to close? Somebody has 
uh, Primerica talked about having a single focusing objective for this year. We're going to add more people. That's our gap. Every dollar you spend has to be able to show how to add more reps. I'm sorry, I don't remember the term, but add more reps to our, to our, to our organization, right? So that's a nice focusing thing. Anything that doesn't solve that problem, even if something's really broken, it isn't the next best dollar spent. And so it becomes really important to get super clear on your organizational structure, get super clear on what it means to be successful in contact with your customer or the things you're doing to eventually support your customer, and then form teams all the way down that can deliver on it. That's hard stuff to do, right? There's no way to make this agility work without the right structural things in place. Then here's another thing that's really cool. Um, once I've got those teams and have them aligned, I have to invest in technology that enables those teams to produce value. We see a big failure mode in a lot of organizations that are um, investing in DevOps or technology or CICD or test automation or all of these things, but they're investing either to compensate for the fact they have all these problems because they're project-based, they have technical debt, and they're actually slowing things down with their technology, or they're hardening bad process that will be difficult to get out of, or they're creating new dependencies. Remember when we first talked about forming teams, I've got to encapsulate every single dependency I can. Technology is a way to remove more and more dependencies from the organization over time. If I can, through CI, CD, and good automated testing, if I can move testing inside of a delivery team or inside of a program team and integration testing inside of a program team, I can remove dependencies. But if I'm using technology to increase dependencies, it's a failure mode. So when you go back and look at your organization, are you forming stable teams that are staying together over time, relatively persistent? Are they connected with decision rights and agency and information all the way up to contact with the customer? Are they persistent all the way around the capability and do they understand what it means to perform successfully? Um, and are we using technology to enable them or is technology getting in their way? So that's kind of my first talk about aligning the structure. That's my first piece. You guys good with that? All right? So go home and look at your organizations. If you can't do those things, you can't achieve the type of agility that we're talking about, which is enterprise business type agility. Um, governance, so bad governance is an interesting thing. Um, we have a client that we're working with in Indianapolis who has a really heavy governance model. And, and their governance model exists for a very good reason. They're under all kinds of federal regulatory things. They're under all kinds of rules. They have all kinds of ethics things they have to manage. Their governance model is there for a reason. But their governance model is actually focused on producing documents to keep them from being sued in court. It's to keep them out of trouble. Now, the people working those jobs will tell you that they're doing their best and I think they are in the, in the design of the system. They're doing their best to act responsibly, but A, because they don't have stable teams connected all the way to the top and can't manage the work and create the conditions for work to flow, um, the best they can do is just document things in a point in time and cause everything to stop all the time. One of the big changes you have to make in a high compliance environment, Brian, with the financial services stuff that we were doing um, 10 years ago, one of the big things we did is we figured out how to integrate the compliance into the process of moving work forward. So at this point, these people have to be involved. My governance model has to get the right people in the room with the right information at the right time to make a decision because those compliance decisions made at the wrong time or with the wrong information are incredibly expensive. I don't know if you've ever been involved in a project where you got 80 to 90% of the way done and you put it in front of your compliance group or you put it in front of your customer or you put it in front of the business security people or the legal people. And you had to go back and rebuild a lot of stuff because you hadn't had the right people involved at the right time. The point of your governance model is to increase the speed of decisions, but not just make them fast in a reckless way, but actually improve the responsibility. That group in Fiserv had the highest compliance scores in audits because they were so intentional about integrating the flow of work together, not keeping them as separate, um, as separate I, um, items. So making the workflow faster decisions is a key part of your governance model. If your governance model is, is overhead, in the way, causing problems, not adding value, not making sure the right decisions are getting made at the right time, you probably need to relook at your governance model. Um, if you build the right governance model and you get the right sort of connections in place, the right kind of rules, we actually create, you know this thing about um, having agency for teams, teams having permission to make a lot of decisions? That doesn't happen by accident, does it? So if I can build a clear governance model that makes it super clear what rules get made, what information flows where, and how we make decisions, I can start to build a system where we can delegate decision making down. You have to have it defined, stable teams, clear outcomes, what they're responsible for. Now I can set up 
a flow of information and decisions in the organization that get those teams with what they need in order to delegate decisions down in a trustworthy fashion. Your governance model's purpose is to design a trustworthy system to allow for intentional agility. Um, there's a big piece of this which comes to um, uh, it all being outcome focused as well. There's a, there's a huge gap, again, this fire and forget sort of order taking, uh, you know, those, that's the two sides of the problem, portfolio, order, fire and forgetting, um, delivery teams just delivering. We need to get executives to understand that they need to fund outcomes, create a clear model where those outcomes are cascaded down into the organization and what it means to be successful at each level of the organization is clear enough that people can make constrained decisions within that. Right now, if I don't know what it means, if I, if I can't decide whether this is a good thing or a bad thing to do to add more reps, but I've been told to build this thing, I'm going to go build it. But if I understand why that customer is important and how this thing is going to help them get there, and, um, and the green sky, um, Stefan talked a little bit about the innovation that comes out of uh, being able to build the right rules of the game in place, because now the business and customer are talking at the right time. Uh, with the right information. So they're able to make those trade-offs. So if it's outcome focused and we're having discussions about what we're trying to accomplish and it's all the way up and down the stack connected to the performance in the market, we can start to make the right kind of trade-offs. Your governance model's job, Brian put a picture up of it, is to make sure the assumptions are flowing down and the learnings are flowing up. It's to make sure that we're only building what we have to build to solve the problem for the customer. It's about stopping when you're doing something stupid. Do you guys ever keep building stuff that you shouldn't be building in your organizations? Anybody ever seen that? Yep. Anybody who didn't raise their hand is lying or unaware. So the point of your governance model is to accelerate the decision-making process, not slow it down, and to make it more responsible in the process. It's to create opportunities for intentional agility. If we don't create the conditions for these teams that we form to make decisions fast, and give them all the information and agency needed and set the rules of the game up so they can make those decisions, you're not going to get agility anywhere. You're not going to get to the top. You're not going to get to the bottom. And you have to be outcome focused. You can't just be telling people what to do. You have to be delegating the context of it down. You have to be delegating the why of the work down and have some way to validate that it's been understood frequently. So that's, that's your governance model. Does anybody's governance model facilitate, uh, pr provide that sort of capability in their organization? Wouldn't that be a good governance model to have? All right. So what's interesting is the governance models we have today are formed to compensate for the fact that we don't have well-structured teams. You can't build this governance model if you don't have the right structure in place. Because you can't create the accountability and you can't create the learnings, you can't create the stability for the governance model to work if you haven't built the teams. Okay? Structure, governance. What are we going to measure? What's the purpose of measuring things in an organization? It's to figure out who to hold accountable, right? Who to blame? Who's at fault? Um, I think an important part of measuring things is to, um, is to uh, determine two years in advance uh, what we want in the organization and set up strategies for people um, to continually improve their group and then pay them for continually improving it. There's a fascinating thing that I saw at one of our clients a few years ago, and I was talking to their portfolio manager, and I said, these are really, really bad measures. Because the measures were, here are your key performance indicators, and everybody's going to improve their key performance indicators um, by 20% in the next year. And here's your budget to do it. The problem is, is not everybody had a problem that was 20% bad. Right? And so we had somebody call up the, I said, I said somebody's going to call you before Thanksgiving and tell you their project has to get through the portfolio system so they can get funded, so they can get their Christmas bonus. She goes, that'll never happen. She calls me about two days before Thanksgiving. You'll never guess what happened today. We, we have a call center, which is performing admirably. It's one of the top call centers in the organization. It's been well managed for years. Um, there's a major software update that they need to get funded this year and get in place by the end of the year, and we've been blocking it because they're just not a problem. But she called me up crying because she needs to get presents for her kids for Christmas because she got divorced this year and doesn't have the income that she needed. So she's in a horrible position, but the system is broken. That's the wrong stuff to be measuring, right? So it becomes very interesting. What we measure has, has really interesting challenges. We were talking a little bit earlier about in really large-scale organizations, what you measure in the small often has devastating unintended consequences at the top, too. There's a lot that goes into it. So what sorts of things do we want to measure? This concept of flow over utilization. You saw in the Green Sky case study that they were producing more projects more frequently. 
right? They were getting stuff out the door more frequently, and that was valuable to the product guy, who, by the way, has a great product story to tell as well. Had a great, it, it, was, it was great for the product guy because he can now have optionality built in. It wasn't about how busy people are. It was about flow. One of the interesting conversations we have with almost every client is, but I've got to keep everybody busy. I've got to keep everybody busy. And my answer to that kind of is, well, that's probably foolish if it's expensive because you're getting too much whip because you're trying to keep everybody busy. If you don't have the right mix of skills or the ability to have cross-functional teams that can share things or the ability to swarm on things, there's all kinds of things we can solve from a structural standpoint or from a governance standpoint to make sure that we're getting the maximum utilization. But if I have to trade off utilization over flow, which is more important to me? What do you guys think? Flow. I got to get stuff to my customer faster, right? So if you have the problem of, but in order to keep everybody busy, I have to work on 10 times too many things. What do you think the problem is? Is it a, is it a everybody busy problem or is it a structural design problem? You have too many of something and not enough of something else, right? Or your governance model isn't paying attention to the capacity that's available and sequencing the work to maximize the utilization. But if you're measuring just, just utilization, and a lot, of, a lot of places are, if you're doing project-based work, it's the only thing to do. I've got to have all my people down this side on my projects across the top, keep everybody busy. You guys seen that spreadsheet? Right? Talk about destroying the ability of an organization to get anything done with any kind of feedback, done. So you've got, you got to focus on flow, and then you have to maximize efficiency within the system of flow. So you've got to be measuring efficiency and flow. One of the critical things that we measure from an efficiency standpoint is the health of the capabilities themselves. This thing where it used to, I used to get rewarded for finishing my projects, but my technical debt goes down, my ability to support it goes down, my ability to deploy it goes down. All the things outside of the organization that actually matter to the customer, but we're getting our projects done on time. Right? We're delivering features really, really fast, but um, the customer, it's not useful to the customer, or it takes forever to get the next thing in. We have to be able to measure the health of the capability. Creating that capability-based team and creating ownership for that group of people on the capability is how we start to be able to manage to the health capability. Because in a lot of cases, if we were measuring it, but we don't have the right structure in place, or we don't have the right governance model to, make, to bring this information, this feedback into our decision making, it doesn't matter if you measure the health of your capability or not. How many of you run a technical debt score on your product? How many of you run an average, a, a mean time between failure on your products from a customer standpoint? How many of you are running the types of metrics that tell you whether the thing you're delivering to your customer is healthy or not? If you're not measuring it, you can't improve it. And if you're not measuring and improving it, I guarantee you it's not getting better. You guys agree with that? So we gotta measure flow, we gotta measure the health of our capability, and then going back to, I built my organization around capabilities. I defined what it meant to be a successful outcome. I've broken that up into performance gaps, and I'm now measuring progress towards closing those performance gaps. The only meaningful thing is my organization's ability to make money today and in the future. Right? The only meaningful thing is the sustainability of my organization and keeping our value promise to the organization. So we got to be measuring that. And people go, that's too hard to measure. It's impossible to measure because you don't have stable teams formed around capabilities. You don't have a capability model. You don't, you, don't, you don't have a governance model that flows that work together. And so you don't have any way to measure it because none of the infrastructure is in place to make that available. So you can't even make the right decisions at the portfolio level. You can't even make the right trade-off decisions. You can't even make the next right funding decision. So you gotta have the right structure, the right governance, the right measures. Then what becomes really, really interesting is no matter what process you put in place, your leadership, particularly your middle tier of leadership in your organization, can make or break the delivery of this. And we get a lot of conversation about, again, this servant leadership stuff. Tell people to be nice, tell people to believe, just trust the system. It's, it, it's the most destructive uh, advice I've ever seen. We need to teach those. If I have designed a system that requires scrum masters and coaches to protect my organization from management, how long is that organization gonna stay in place? Management will beat it back into the dysfunctional shape that it was in in the first place. Does that resonate with y'all? Do you see what I'm saying? If we build this thing so that it requires protection from management, it's completely the wrong approach. It may require somebody to get it there and then lift management up to run it because they don't know how to run the new system. Like that's completely reasonable. 
But if we have to put a layer between management and the system to protect it, that's faulty. So we have to teach our leaders to protect the system. They've got to be able to understand the impacts of capacity and demand and flow on the system, right? They've got to be able to understand what it means to have outcome success. We have to align our measures and our incentive structures within the organization, our accountability models, so that leadership is held accountable for, the, for their organization's ability to operate in the new model. If we don't do that, they're going to bring it back to what it's always been. We've got to teach them if they don't understand the performance of the system, they don't know how to improve the system. So there's a constant sort of learning. What does structure look like? What does governance look like? What am I measuring and managing? How does this help me be successful? Man, this stuff isn't hard. I think it's actually very intuitive. If you're on a board and you land it, you go, that's kind of even arguable. That would be better. That's kind of absolutely true. That would be better. That's not, we don't know how to get there. We've got to teach our managers that that's what the system needs to look like that they're running and then show them how to run the new system. They have to be able to improve the system. Um, they have to be able to understand where the system isn't performing the way that it's supposed to perform and make improvements in it. How do I remove impediments? How do I remove dependencies? What's fascinating to me is the misinterpretation of, of um, removing impediments in an organization in most people's interpretation of Scrum. Does that mean going and running a crisis down? Are impediments like, like, like an individual block on an individual piece of work? Are impediments design of the organization problems that make it hard for us to operate? Management's job is to remove impediments. It's not to go resource manage and drag people to the crisis and di disrupt everything in the organization. It's to go make that problem not happen again. Management's job is to create a trustworthy system that they can delegate into. And it's really fascinating. When we talk about managers losing authority, losing power in these new agile worlds, do you know how much more authority and power and insight they have? when they're designing and running the system effectively, how many more people's lives they're improving, how much more value they're creating for the organization. Like in every way that matters, leadership and management has more power and authority in this agile organization I'm describing than they did in their old way of running things. You guys believe that? And so we gotta get them to want that. We gotta get them to feel that that's what they need and then show them how to go do it because they have to lead the system. Um, if you don't get leadership on board, it doesn't matter what else you do. And it doesn't mean executive leadership. If you get leadership on board and you don't know what to tell them to go do, it doesn't matter that you've got leadership on board. So what does a good structure look like? What does the right governance look like? What are the right things to measure and manage? How do I use that information to continually improve the system, increase my ability to make value flow, increase my organization's ability to achieve its strategy in the future? To accomplish all these things we want with agility, Right? We have to teach management how they get that out of the system. So um, just sort of to, to wrap up here, when I walk into an organization, we can spend two or three days in an organization. I can pretty quickly tell you they're, they're giant problems. And we can tell you that most people are not operating at this fine edge of a couple little tweaks will deliver a ton of value. There's a lot of things you can do without, without blowing the world up and make things better. But if you really want to fundamentally become the type of organization that can execute its strategy in a rapidly changing world, going back to Brian's sort of discussion of agility, you've got to be able to get it, but this is important. They're kind of in this order. You've got to get the right structure in place. You've got to connect all the way from the customer within the capability and get clarity on it, top to bottom. You've got to be able to use technology to enable encapsulation, not to create dependencies, right? You've got to be able then to put a governance model around that organization that maximizes the flow of decision making, that creates the conditions for agility to exist in the organization. You've got to be able to create the governance within that structure. If you do the governance before you do the structure, you're going to stumble. It's not going to be the right governance model because you're, co you're having to compensate for broken team design. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Um, once you've got that, now you can start to measure and manage value because you can actually measure the right things. If you're measuring capability performance and you have no ability to impact the backlogs to change the capabilities performance, it's a worthless thing to measure because all you can do is beat somebody up with it. Everything you measure has to be something that you're going to change from. If I'm looking at capability health, looking at performance gaps, we start to measure the right things. Everything you measure has to be something that management can use, that leadership can use to make effective improvements. Otherwise, they're bad metrics and they will backfire on you. They'll backfire on you anyway, so you've got to pay attention to them, change them from time to time. I mean, that's just a reality of life. But you've got to be, in, your intent has to be 
measuring the right things to make the right improvements in the organization. It can't be your velocity is lower than your velocity, so therefore we can't achieve our strategy. That's a, it's an uninteresting conversation, right? I'm spending money. I'm making progress towards my value proposition. That's a good thing to measure. And then we have to initially compensate for leadership's lack of understanding of the new system because they've been successful running the world a new way. But I guarantee if you went to them and said, do you care about the performance of the organization? Do you want this adaptability? Do you want this? They want it. The problem is when we go give them models that will never work, go do Scrum at Scale. Just go read the book, do Scrum at Scale, create some Scrum Masters, and you'll be much safer as a manager. That, that angers me. It does. It's irresponsible. It's taking money. It's taking money and it's criminal. I love the Scrum at Scale guys. I think they do some really good work. But I think their, per, their lens is very much creating safety for the Scrum teams, not creating business value for the enterprise. I think changing the conversation from the top down, as Mike was talking about, that's a critical part of what we need to go toward, is changing the conversation. So we're going to teach leaders what it means to lead these organizations in this new model. So uh, thank you very much.